Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Good afternoon. I'm Vince Puzak. I'm the editor-in-chief of Volume 16 of the Journal of Law and Liberty. We're so happy to have all of you here today as we ask the question, what is the rule of law in the administrative state? And we really look forward to today's discussion. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to say a few thank yous. Um, first off, to all of our panelists, speakers, and moderators today, thank you so much for coming. We really couldn't have this discussion without you. Hello, Professor Epstein. Uh, <laughs> second, I'd <laughs> second, I'd really love to thank the C. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State um, for generously sponsoring this symposium with the journal. Um, we really appreciate all the work that you do, and we couldn't have done this without you. Third, I'd like to thank the symposium editors who are assisting the journal in preparing the pieces that will, will come from the symposium. We couldn't publish without you, so thank you. Some of you are in the audience, and for whichever ones watch the recording, thank you so much for your help. Um, fourth, I'd love to thank NYU Law School for providing the venues. And finally, I'd like to thank the journal's managing editor for development, Ajay Iyer, um, who really took point on putting this whole event together. So with that all said, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Adam White to get things introduced. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, thanks, by the way, to Vince when he introduced me. There's usually a 50-50 chance when somebody introduces me that they introduce me as co-directing the Center for the Administrative State. I have to say, no, that's actually, that's actually at NYU. Uh, <laughs> sorry, no. Um, but no, it's a real pleasure to get to do this. We, we cooked this symposium up about a year ago uh, and are really, really grateful to get to work with the Journal of Law and Liberty's editors, the students here. It's been a great process. A lot of fun putting this together. We're very excited to see the articles come together and very, very excited to be here in person to get to start conversations about this. At the Gray Center, most of what we do is just fostering debate and discussion and encouraging scholarship on administrative law. Uh, the people who come to our workshops are roundtables, they write papers, they debate, and they find ways to disagree about just about everything. The one thing everybody tends to agree on is that they're in favor of the rule of law. No matter what your disagreement is on a particular issue of administrative law, everybody who comes through the Gray Center to, to discuss and debate, we all agree fundamentally, at some level of gener generality at least, on the rule of law. And a while ago, Ron Cass and I began to think about that, what that meant, what it meant about people's implicit understandings of what the rule of law means. And so we thought, well, why don't we take this implicit debate and just pose the question explicitly? What does the rule of law mean? What should it mean in modern administrative law? And so that was the, uh, the origins of this symposium. Uh, I want to thank all of the authors and other participants in the program. We want to say a word about Ron Cass. He was very sorry not to be able to join us today. Uh, and again, he helped to bring this, uh, bring this about in the first place. About 20 years ago, he published a book called The Rule of Law in America. Uh, and uh, he's obviously been thinking about this for quite a long time. He's been a central part of the Gray Center's work. And he has the lead essay in this symposium. He titled it, uh, Delegation and the Administrative State, First Steps Towards Finding a Rule of Law Paradox. And the point he makes in the essay is that the rule of law is not the same as just rule. Uh, it's not the same as justice. It means something very particular. And he thinks through what it means in the context of administrative law. He said procedures and checks and balances are very important, but they don't necessarily align agencies with the law. Congress, for example, has a lot of influence over agencies through its power of the purse. Congress doesn't always nudge agencies in a more lawful direction. Sometimes Congress is working to distract or deter an agency from carrying out its lawful mission. Sometimes not, but sometimes it does. And he says Chevron, another example he focuses on, Chevron was designed, or at least originally conceived, to support the rule of law as its uh, originators saw it. But now it seems to, to undermine the rule of law, at least as, as Ron sees this. And so he focuses in his paper, unsurprisingly, on non-delegation. So I hope you'll read his paper, but I also hope you'll read the other papers in this series. We're very, very lucky to be joined by a couple of the authors by uh, Noah Rosenblum from your own New York University Law School and Professor Philip Hamburger from a small uh, law school at the north end of town. Uh, they're both writing in the symposium. And as it happens, the other author from Columbia, 
Tom Merrill, he's not writing in this symposium, but just a few months ago published a paper in the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy titled The Essential Meaning of the Rule of Law. So how could we not invite him to the symposium? And then last, we're very, very lucky to be joined by Judge Rachel Kovner to moderate this conversation. As you all know, she is a district judge in the US, court, uh, US District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Before that, she served as an assistant US attorney here in the Southern District of New York and worked in the Solicitor General's office. And she clerked for a couple of my favorite judges, uh, Justice Scalia and Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson. So I'll turn it over to Judge Kovner. Thanks again. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, get to hear all of you in conversation about these pieces, which I think are reflect very different perspectives on, on the rule of law question. Um, and I think the way we had talked about doing it is maybe just have each person start by talking about their their paper or their thoughts on this topic, starting with uh, Professor Rosenblum, who's a local local person. Thank you, Judge. Um, thank you so much for moderating. Uh, thank you, thank you all. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I just want to start by saying how proud I am of our students for organizing this event. I think it's a really important topic. I'm delighted you're putting it on. Um, special thanks to Adam and the Gray Center. Uh, I love being the fly in your ointment. Bring me back anytime. Um, the theme of our symposium is the rule of law in the administrative state, which sounds like it should be a universal question on par with the really great puzzles like what is the nature of democracy or what is the relationship between law and justice. Of course, I love questions like this. Um, we were just talking earlier, I did my PhD in history at Columbia where I studied intellectual history, so history of philosophy, totally my jam. And my dirty secret is that my first teachers were actually Straussians, so I'm all about the deep eternal questions and where they come from. But the basic proposition of my remarks today and the paper I'm writing for the symposium is that the question of the rule of law in the administrative state is not one of these questions, it is not a universal question. It is not a profound philosophical question. I'm not even sure it's a hard question. So in the next eight minutes, I'm going to try to make three points related to that theme. In the paper, I also have a prediction, but you're going to have to read the written paper whenever I finish it to figure out what the prediction is. Um, so the three points. First, that this is not a universal question, but one that is bounded in time and space. Second, that the attempt to make it a profound question, or even just a serious legal question, is actually a move in a fight over political economy. And finally, that in any case, the real game here is about institutional design, not doctrine. And so this is all a bit of a sideshow. OK, first observation, right? not a universal question. So every industrialized society has administration. In fact, most pre-industrial societies have administration. While administration did not attract the same amount of attention by classical Western political theorists as other of the great political theory and democracy questions, it is an inextricable part of every historical polity with which I am familiar. And yet, the question of the rule of law in the administrative state or the place of the rule of law in administration doesn't seem to come up. So it seems to be everywhere, and yet nobody else seems to be worried about it. Right? So an example, right? Germany has something like the rule of law, the tradition of the Rechtsstaat. And as Dieter Grimm taught me years ago, the Rechtsstaat concept emerges in the 19th century as a check on what is essentially a caste-based system of noble power that seems to be running German government before. The ascendant bourgeoisie turns to the Rechtsstaat as a tool to try to rein the Kaiser in. Um, so far, so very rule of law-like, right? Law as a check on government in the name of protecting rights. And yet, it doesn't seem that the Germans are overly worried about whether administrative action raises problems for the Reichstadt, right? The challenge in German law is about preserving the chain of legitimation. I won't try to pronounce that one in German. Um, to make sure that it is kept intact, that bureaucratic action, um, uh, uh, bureaucratic action remains legitimate. So such bureaucratic action is as much a part of the Reichstadt as anything else, right? No tension there. OK, an example that I know a little bit better, France seems to be even more true in France. So in France, they have the état de droit, right, which has been around since at least the French Revolution. The key commitment of the état de droit is, again, to the idea of channeling state coercive authority through law. So again, very rule of law-like, and again, no sense in which administrative action is in tension with the état de droit. In fact, 
the opposite, right? Administration in France acts through law. The état de droit is realized through administrative action. French administrative tribunals just are part of the way the French understand the rule of law. Um, these are very well-known examples. I'm not really doing either of them justice. The point I'm trying to make is simple and boring, that although everybody has administration and lots of people have something sort of like the rule of law, almost no one else worries about the tension between the two. OK, so why is this something Americans worry about? Well, this takes me to my second observation about American political economy. So it's not the case that Americans always worried about administration and the rule of law. In the early republic, we have lots of administrative action without much worry about the rule of law, right? including massive delegations to the government to regulate private rights, like adjust tax rates, and later invasive regulations of new technologies, like steamboat commissions, and people aren't worried about the rule of law. Right? Now, of course, we are a disputatious people, constantly accusing each other of law-breaking. Famously, in the first contested presidential election, the elections of 1800, right, everybody accused the other side of, of undermining the Constitution, violating the rule of law, being generally terrible, um, although I don't think anyone accused the other party of grooming, although we'd really have to look into that to be sure. It would be good to check. The press was really vicious back then, too. But right, lots of admin, not a lot of worry about the rule of law. Of course, the tenor of administration changes. Right? With industrialization, we have a host of new social and political problems. A new generation of economists and lawyers who argue that government, uh, sorry, I just lost my place. A new generation of economists and lawyers who argue that government intervention is counterproductive, needs to be resisted. This is, of course, the rise of the classical laissez-faire tradition. That's very much a 19th century idea. Right? It's at the cutting edge of its day. And those partisans, for the most part, are unpersuasive, right? The new laissez-faire economists, they argue, they lose. And we get what Steve Skoranek and Karen Oren have called an expansion of the policy space with the growth of the policy state. Now, just how new the policy state was and new in what ways is a subject of ongoing debate. I'd say the dominant view among legal historians is that there was a lot of business regulation at the state and local level, even before we see the expansion of state capacity during the progressive era. But the progressive innovation is to take that regulation into new areas at a new scale, with some innovations in institutional design as well. Now, the most important feature of that newly emerging administrative state is its enemy. Right? It's been a while since I did my oral exam on the history of capitalism in US businesses, so I'm not going to be as up on the facts as I should be. But the basic story is pretty undisputed which is that the second half of the 19th century sees the emergence of these huge business concerns. The trusts, of course, but also vertically and horizontally integrated business interests. And those are very, they're, they're massive. They're, they're in, they're, their capitalization is larger than the entire sum of federal government expenditures at the time. So they're huge. Um, and, and they're subject to the new progressive era regulation. And they don't like it. right? Remember those laissez-faire types, the intellectuals? They give them an intellectually coherent reason for why they shouldn't like it. The business doesn't like it because it affects their bottom line. But the intellectually coherent reason is that this would mess with the uh, way in which society is supposed to be self-organizing. Right? Most of these laissez-faire intellectuals are social Darwinists. They think social regulation undercuts the self-regulating capacity of the species. If you try to hold up those who can't succeed in competition, you will simply make the entire human race worse off. So those intellectuals provide cover for large business that is concerned about the effect of their bottom line. And, uh, and we get common cause and a new critique of regulation, right? a particular politics of regulatory critique. Now that dynamic will recur in almost that exact form regularly over the course of the next decades as new regulations are introduced. <clears throat> business has an interest in fighting regulation to protect its bottom line, and intellectuals have a critique that business finds useful. What happens then is that business will fight the regulation, and if they lose, they'll take a second shot by fighting not the specific regulation, but the whole notion of legitimate regulation itself. So in the progressive era, we see attacks on specific acts of worker regulation, and then attacks on the right of the state to regulate labor, period. In the New Deal, the DuPont family funds attacks on specific regulations, and then the initial attack on the administrative state all the way through the 1980s and even to today. Right? It's structural political economy that generates these recurring conflicts. 
If regulation is expensive, it's rational to attack the regulation and then attack the regulatory institution as such, right? The right to regulate. Okay, so what do we make of these fights? That takes me to my third observation, and then I'll conclude, or I guess this is my conclusion, right? That, that it's about the importance of structure. So in the United States, objections to administration are directed at judges for sociological reasons. Right? Basically, federal judges used to be company lawyers. The way you become a judge in 19th century America, late 19th century America, you work for the Republican Party after having a career, first with a mining industry or with a railroad, the very industries that are subject to regulation. So the regulated industries can be sure of getting a favorable hearing in front of the judges who used to work for them. So of course they target the courts. Now this works as long as those judges are sympathetic and had power, um, and, and as long as you have judges that is who are also regulation skeptics, and you know that Congress and the president are unlikely to respond if you get a favorable ruling, right? Then that's likely to be a favorable strategy. You go to the judge, the judge will listen, and the other political branches won't respond. Um, of course, as you intuited, we are living through such a moment now, which is part of why I think we see a resurgence of these kinds of arguments and worries. So that explains why these arguments are going to court. But what do those arguments do in court? Well, here I think structure can also be useful, and that's what I'm gonna end on. So very few people want to get rid of administration completely. It's hard to even know what a world without administration would look like. Remember, administration, every modern society and most pre-industrial societies also, you need administration if you want a government that does anything like what any modern government does from having an army, to doing border control, to providing health insurance. But if you have administration, then you have a basic personnel management problem. There are just so few supervisors and so many people who work in administration, so many government officers. Bureaucracy is inevitable. <coughs> this is true even, or maybe especially, if you're going to make your supervision happen through federal courts. Right? There just aren't a lot of judges. Now, obviously, this isn't the only way to do it, but judicial review has been a key part of the way American administrative law was developed and unfolded. So if we want to do that, then we're going to be asking a very small number of judges to legitimate a huge number of other administrative actors, right? a huge administrative apparatus. That structure will create its own logic, which in turn will become doctrine. So even without a formal doctrine of deference, as in Chevron, you're going to end up with some kind of reliance interest or a kind of deference, which of course is Skidmore. And as I teach in my leg reg class, the actual daylight between Skidmore and Chevron when we get to institutions turned out to be much, much smaller than law professors like me make it so that we can publish articles to get tenure. So with that, I'll stop and turn it back to the judge. All right, great. I think uh, Professor Hamburger is up next. Thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for, for oh. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to begin just to in, get a little more debate going here rather than presentation with a little bit of a response, and then I'll present my own material. Um, it suggested that every society has administration and needs it, and uh, certainly when it, uh, you know, there are a lot of European societies that have it, China. Um, this was summarized by the fascist George Michael um, as bureaucracy happens, right? You know what else happens, right? Um, and I, I just don't think that's quite true. Um, now, at the University of Chicago, where I used to be, you would just look at anything in the status quo and give an economic explanation for it. It happens, and so it has to have some reason. But it seems to me that's a remarkably pro-status quo vision of the world. Um, in fact, European uh, administrative power and Chinese administrative power comes out of an imperial Roman tradition. Um, Goodna went to China, start drafting their constitution to sort of reconfigure their more very different type of administrative power. Uh, it, it starts in Europe among the Burgundians in the 14th century. The French pick it up, of course, because it's more or less the same country. Um, and the Prussians pick it up. And the Prussians theorize it more than anybody else. Uh, we don't we didn't go through that whole story now. I've told it before. Suffice it to say, it's not a story with a happy ending, right? Um, it leads to what Max Weber calls ordnungsmenschen, people who like to be told what to do, who get panic when they don't, aren't told what to do. This is not self-governments, and that should worry us. Um, second, um, it's often said that business doesn't like the administrative state, and that's why we have opposition to it. Um, well, that's certainly true for some types of business, small, local, mid-sized business. Um, it's not so true of the very largest businesses. 
those who are bureaucratized and work well with federal bureaucracy, those that are not located in any particular place, the really massive ones, they actually can control the Ministry of State to some degree, and to the extent they can uh, work with it, they can exclude the competitors um, through the cost of regulation, as we all know. Um, and by the way, that gets to DuPont. DuPont is, however big, a remarkably localized business. Those refineries are very expensive. You don't move around. You're localized. There's still a lot of family ownership and involvement. Um, it's not an accident that they would feel this way. It, it actually fits my view. Um, and then third, all of this leads to the suggestion that those who oppose the administrative state are doing for economic reasons. I assure you, I have no economic re interest in this at all. Instead, this is a civil rights movement. It's been viewed often as a structural question, but it affect, affects people's civil rights. And you might say, well, it's just business civil rights or the rights of individuals who are in business, so let's not worry too much about that. But of course, in the last two decades, the administrative state has taken aim at individuals, and people then get it. And if, as I do, you get phone calls in the middle of the night from people who have been hurt seeking representation, by the way, most of the time I can't represent them, um, you talk to adults who are crying because they've been ruined, sometimes deliberately, by the administrative state. I can give you good New York examples if you want them later. OK, now for more fun. Uh, the rule of law. Oh, dear. Um, I don't want to say what I really think about the rule of law. So let's just say that I'll approach it, I'll, I'll just approach it more historically than as some sort of uh, monument we have to worship. Uh, I have four points, and the gist of this is the rule of law offers cold comfort. It's really just an artifact of our anxieties about the legitimacy of the administrative project. Um, the common law ideal was rule through or by law. The early common law ideal, as we know from Bracton, is, uh, is rule under law. He writes about that very elegant, eloquently. And Magna Carta and the medieval due process statutes offer some suggestion of being bound only through the courts. Um, but in the 17th century, uh, after some experience with their version of what we call administrative power, then a more personalized prerogative power, um, there's an interest in a different type of ideal, and that is rule through or by law, and meaning through the law and through the courts. Uh, I could give you a lot of quotes, but it's in the paper. You'll get it. Matthew Hale, Cook, Tristan, they all enunciate this in great and careful detail, making very clear its implications for the power that runs outside the mechanisms of legislation at the courts. Um, second, the United States Constitution actually establishes a version of rule through or by law. Now, how does it do that? Um, legislative power is vested in Congress. And you might say, oh, well, they can delegate that. And we've had a little debate about this recently, as you may have noticed. Um, but actually, you know, two things to consider in this. That debate has unfortunately focused so much on 18, scattered 18th century sources that are rather weak that it doesn't actually focus on the framing and the text. The advocates of delegation just don't want to linger there. With good reason, um, the framers discussed delegation, and they're quite, you know, they're quite clear that there cannot be delegation of legislative judicial power to the executive. In fact, they no, don't view it simply, and this is important for our litigation, simply as a question of what Congress can do. It's what the executive can do. Um, the executive, in order to exercise power that's legislative judicial in its nature, has to be constitutionally authorized to do that, right? Um, to exercise even executive power delegated by Congress. It has to be authorized to exercise that power. And uh, the, the framers reject all such authorization. Um, now, what about the text? It doesn't say, you know, if this is a piece of land or property that could be, you know, vested and then, you know, I've got a property professor here, vested in one, vested in another, you might say, is hereby vested. They don't say that, it says shall be vested. That's a mandatory location. And should you doubt that, we have actually other provisions of the Constitution that are illuminating. I'll just linger on one for the sake of time, which is Article 3. That's right, Article 3 matters. Why? Article 3 authorizes Congress to designate the location of judicial power. That's precisely the sort of structure you don't find in Article 1. It does not authorize Congress to designate the location of legislative power. So it's quite clear the text rejects this and preserves rule through law. As for the courts, again, judicial power shall be vested in the courts. And what's more, we have the due process clause. Due process has been reduced to justify administrative power in part to this sort of this, this vague thing, fairness and a hearing, a neutral adjudicator, all of which is fairly weak. It's not the gnarly old common law uh, procedures. 
The old due process of law was that you could not be held to account, you could not be even asked to answer a question except through the process of law, meaning the courts of law. Everything had to go through the courts of law. And by the way, that's been clear since the, you know, the 1350s. And it was well understood by all the early founders who discussed this quite explicitly. Kent, Tucker, Rapturing on the Constitution already in the early uh, 1790s story. But all that's now been brushed aside so we can have adjudication outside those courts. So um, it's quite clear that the, mo that the modern principle has very, uh, rule of law has very little historical depth. The tradition we inherited and instantiated in the Constitution is rule through law. So where did we get the rule of law? Yes, it's partly from the Reichstag. Um, and it's chiefly as a means of justifying the administrative state, or at least wiggling around it, right? Um, the Reichstag, by the way, was not a noble principle. It's what the Germans started talk German liberals started talking about after 1848, after they failed to get rule through law. The failure of Frankfurt Constitution led to this. So it's, it's not as if this is what the German liberals really wanted. It was second best. By the way, the German administrative state is much better than ours, because it is quite orderly. Um, I, I want to jump ahead because I have a limited amount of time. Um, my fourth point is, even if you wanted the rule of law, whatever that may be, um, administrative governance actually is a rather unruly thing. And um, we don't really appreciate that. It's taught as prototypically notice and comment rulemaking and ALJ decision making, and they're appointed by merit. Oh, dear. Um, that's just not the way it is, right? Um, those things do exist. But for example, most ALJs are not appointed through the merit system. They're borrowed from, the agencies borrow, take them from Social Security Administration where they're not accustomed to worrying about the obligation of law and they're not accustomed to resisting their agency. ALJs um, can have their salaries adjusted if they are not efficient, which means following agency policy. You see that leads. They can actually be ripped. They can have their whole positions removed, right, if they, but, push against the agency. And by the way, that has happened and every ALJ, um, at least in the financial sector, knows about this. I think about it. Um, when they reach decisions, it's not their decision. It's reviewed or finalized by the political appointees in their agency, right? Which, by the way, conflicts with Hayburn's case as well as separation of powers and due process. Um, this is entirely unruly. And of course, much administrative law is not done through rules at all. It's done through waivers. It's done through guidance. It's done through... Um, uh, site visits, it's done through threats, it's done through um, third party boycotts. And by the way, if you, if you think this is just happens at the periphery, that's simply untrue, get real. So I'm going to tell you a story. I can't put a name on it because that's just complicated for the individual involved. So I know somebody um, who had a major business project, put a year into it, massive, you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars investment and a lot of his time and, and effort. The day before it gets announced, guess what happens? Actually, it's the evening, it's a nighttime call. Ring, 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 hello. And let's just say, hi, this is Joe from the Department of, oh, hi, Joe, they know each other. Um, what's up? I gather you're going to be announcing your new venture tomorrow. Yes, that's right, very proud of it. Well, I just want you to know, says Joe, we think that it's entirely within, this, within law. Oh, good, glad to hear it. And it's not contrary to any regulation or current policy. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Because you know, of course it'd been vetted earlier. But, says Joe, we just want you to know that we, that, what was the exact phrase? Um, we just want you to know that we, that we do not think you should go ahead. You should not go ahead. No, we don't think that would be advisable. Oh, thank you, Joe. Have a good evening, click. Um, that's the way we're ruled this day, these days. And then the smaller you are, the rougher it is. So this happens at the highest level. So I don't think we can talk about the rule, even if we think of, we have something called the rule of law, whatever it is, it has nothing to do with law, has nothing to do, and by the way, we can go on and on about nothing to do with law because agencies act outside their authorization, right? And they don't get, you don't really get judicial review without deference, and you have retaliation for seeking judicial review. So it has little to do with law, um, less to do with rules, and a lot to do with a sort of power that can only be called unsanitary. So that's our unruly administrative state. Thank you. So if I'm correctly tabulating it, I think on the theme of rule of law and the administrative state, we have one panelist who's skeptical of the rule of law conception and one panelist who's skeptical of the administrative state as a special concern. And perhaps Professor Merrill is going to defend those themes. 
Well, I'm not going to be skeptical about the rule of law, so I'll add a new element to all this. Um, so, um, like Ron Cass, I guess about uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I began to get interested in the rule of law because everybody seemed to be in favor of it. Uh, you know, it was sort of like, um, uh, you know, it was like mom and apple pie and so forth. And everybody thought that the people that they strongly disagreed with were violating it. Uh, so you got this sort of standard um, trope in the news where, you know, uh, President Obama was uh, uh, accused of violating the rule of law by having the DACA program and the, and the Clean Power Plan, and then Pro President Trump was, oh my God, he was, he was violating the rule of law every day he woke up, and including by, you know, building the border wall with appropriations not approved by Congress, and so, et cetera. And then uh, Joe Biden, not to be outdone, uh, has, uh, you know, tried to suspend uh, student loan payments, uh, and he tried, he, 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 he said when the, uh, when they got around to the CDC banning evictions uh, from uh, uh, renters who had not paid their rent, that, uh, well, it's probably not legal, but at least it'll buy some time. This was his statement to the press. So uh, so we we have a lot of, uh, and of course, then the Republicans all said this was violating the rule of law. So I began to be interested, what exactly does the rule of law mean? And I'm, I'm not going to get hung up on prepositions about rule by law, rule through law, rule of law, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, and I did some reading. I, I quickly learned that there's a vast literature out there, and I didn't begin to plumb all of it. But there, there seem to be two traditions about the understanding of the rule of law. And they go by various names. Uh, one is called thin, and the other is called thick, and one is called formal, and the other is called substantive, and so forth. So uh, naturally, I gravita gravitated toward the thin and formal <laughs> conceptions of the rule of law. <laughs> um, um, basically, I, I changed the name slightly. Um, the thin uh, formal I call the predictive law model, uh, and the uh, thick substantive I call the rights model. So um, the proponents of this um, uh, predictive model, a uh, pretty good list, Magna Carta comes in the picture here, and um, uh, Dicey, who wrote about the English Constitution, uh, coined the phrase rule of law. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, who I read significantly uh, in, uh, was the great uh, proponent and theorist about the rule of law and how it promotes individual liberty. Uh, uh, and then some contemporary thinkers like Joseph Raz, the late Joseph Raz, who taught at Columbia, uh, was a proponent of this uh, predictive law model. At Lawn Fuller at Harvard, although he didn't use the rule of law, I think was very much within this camp as well. So. The basic idea of the predictive model is that the rule of law means that it is predictable when the executive is going to exercise coercion against you. Uh, uh, and that means coercion means you know taking your property or, or seizing you and putting you in jail or whatever. If, if it's predictable when that will happen, uh, then that then the rule of law has been uh, is in existence and you can adjust your affairs to avoid uh, these calamities. Um, very thin, very formalistic, and so forth. The thick version, uh, the, the uh, uh, rights version, actually the rights version was a, a term coined, coined by uh, Ronald Dworkin of this law school. Um, but uh, it really, I think, comes out of the, uh, out of the Nuremberg trials uh, at the end of World War II, uh, uh, which were justified as being consistent with the rule of law because after all, the Nazis were guilty of violating all these fundamental rights that humanity has. Uh, but then it, it, various uh, European institutions or United Nations institutions uh, pick up on this. So the, the rights version is very much the European version of the rule of law, which says that, yes, predictability is important, but it's also important that a certain package of fundamental rights are included within the rule of law. So there's something called the Venice Commission, which is part of the European Union apparatus, which is in charge of uh, explicating the rule of law. Um, uh, they, they, their, their principal report says, well, it's undefinable, uh, but we're going to come out with a checklist of features that are uh, consistent, that, that indicate the rule of law. And the checklist, of course, includes things like, you know, predictability in courts and executives following the law. And it also includes, you know, freedom of speech, and it includes various rights against discrimination. And oh, yes, and it starts to include various positive rights, like to subsistence and health care and, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, the the thick, uh, you know, rights version has sort of morphed into a kind of catalog of things that 
European thinkers uh, describe the liberal uh, constitutional state. Uh, so reading this stuff, I, I came to the conclusion that, there, that there's, some, there's a lot to be said for the, the thin um, uh, predictable law version because uh, it's sort of easier to use that as an evaluative tool than to get this thick rights version. The, the, um, the thin version can be uh, coupled with all sorts of different regimes, uh, uh, minimalist states, maximalist states, even authoritarian states in theory, although maybe not in practice. Um, and uh, the, the rights version uh, is very nebulous. It's very hard to pin down. M my strong suspicion is that the, the rights version has uh, ca sort of uh, capital or taken over the rule of law slogan or phrase because they recognize that the, the predictability of law is a sort of universal value that a whole bunch of people, almost everyone can agree is good. I mean, who, who except uh, a wanton uh, a thug or, or uh, you know, the worst type of bandit would want to have an unpredictable regime. Uh, and so by calling uh, this uh, complicated menu of rights the rule of law, they have sort of tapped into this goodwill that everyone uh, feels towards something that's described as being the rule of law. But the, the analytical clarity breaks down when you start coupling this bundle of rights with, um, with the uh, predictability conception. Now, I think it's a difficult question whether some rights have to be recognized in order for there to be predictability. Um, and I haven't completely come to rest on that myself. Um, uh, but there's some, there's some interesting literature. Um, uh, Frankel's book on the dual state, which is about Nazi Germany up to 1941, talks about the prerogative state uh, and the normative state, the normative state being basically a predictable uh, state and the, and the prerogative state being the Nazis. Uh, and, and makes the argument that you know uh, the Nazis, for their own purposes, kind of segmented things such that the heavy industry and agriculture were governed by a normative state, which has had highly predictable rules, and then the Nazis uh, uh, treated uh, you know people they didn't like, like Jews and invalids and so forth, under this uh, uh, prerogative state where they had no rights whatsoever. So I, I think at least it's theoretically possible to distinguish between pure predictability uh, with maybe a minimal amount, uh, set of rights about access to courts and, and so forth, um, and, and this thicker rights version. What does this have to do uh, with the administrative state? Well, uh, it seems to me, and I agree with uh, Professor Rosenblum on this point, that uh, once if you've settled on an understanding of what the rule of law means, uh, adopted maybe the predictable law version that I do, you then have the question of, well, what kind of a system of government uh, is going to lead to highly predictable law that allows people to organize their private affairs uh, as they see fit uh, and avoid calamities of conflicts with the state? Um, uh, and this is a much harder question to answer. Um, uh, you know, classically, I think um, the Federalist Papers and, and, and authors like Montesquieu and so forth think that separation of powers is critical here. Uh, and there's quite a bit to say for, about that. Uh, I will make a couple points about the administrative state. I think if we, this is, uh, if we look back to the government that uh, Philip is fond of, the, uh, the government that was uh, created by the Constitution and by the various state constitutions that are sort of derivative of the federal Constitution, that form of government, I think, did pretty well under the predictable version of the rule of law. So. Uh, you had one body that was in charge of making uh, rules for society, the legislature, and it was pretty clear that they were expected to do so prospectively, and they were supposed to do so publicly, and they were supposed to you know, publish these uh, laws in ways that were accessible to people. Um, uh, the Constitution doesn't specifically require that non-criminal laws be uh, prospective, but it, in practice, that tends to be uh, the way they work. and. Um, uh, due process norms uh, about fair warning and so forth can come to play even with draconian uh, civil laws. So you have the legislature that's legislating prospectively and so people have a way of knowing what the rules are uh, before they act. Then you have uh, the executive which is under a duty to see that the laws are faithfully executed and the executive branch I think was conceived of as a rather minimal enterprise at the time of the founding, uh, not some kind of uh, repository of enormous administrative powers. Uh, and then they have the courts. Now, I think the courts are kind of the heroes of this story because uh, courts have no powers uh, whatsoever uh, uh, in any real sense. Uh, they are like, and Hamilton was critical, crystal clear about this in Federalist 78. 
they don't have the power of the sword or the purse. Uh, so the interesting question is, you know, what, what are they doing and why does anybody pay any attention to them? Uh, and I think the answer has to be that they uh, decide cases in accordance with settled law. They, just, they, they, they enforce statutes according to the way that an ordinary reader would understand the statute. Um, uh, and uh, when the statute doesn't control or you're, and you're dealing with the common law, uh, they try to decide cases in accordance with settled principles of common law. Uh, and this generates uh, a predictability about a co how courts are going to rule. Now, not obviously in, in every case, there's always you know, new, new, new issues always pop up. But if courts don't uh, decide cases in accordance with their best understanding of settled law, uh, nobody's gonna pay any attention to them uh, because they don't have any power to enforce their judgments. They don't have any power to bring out the army and, and haul somebody off to jail if they defy them. The executive does that. Uh, so in order for courts to play an important role in the system, they have to become basically highly, as predictable as is possible, uh, with some exceptions, of course. Uh, uh, and, and that is, adds an important sort of predictability and therefore, in my view, rule of law dimension to things in society. Uh, now, the, 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 the interesting question then is why does the executive pay any attention to what the courts say? Um, this is a much harder question to answer. Uh, uh, but I think uh, it's sort of intuitive that if the courts are usually deciding cases, contested cases, in accordance with what their, their best understanding of settled law is, they will build up an immense reservoir of goodwill with society because people like to live in a world that has predictability about it. Uh, and if the ze executive suddenly announces, well, we don't give a hoot what the court says, I mean, in this case, we're not going to enforce the judgment, or we don't care what the courts say the statute means, we're just going to have our own interpretation, we're going to have an office of compliance in the executive branch that decides which judgments we're going to enforce and which uh, judicial understandings we're going to accept. Uh, I think the public uh, would not like that, and I think that the executive would have to pay a political price for that, and so I think uh, over time, if the courts are predictable, if they enforce settled law, the executive will have a tendency to comply with judicial understandings and judicial judgments, and so you get a kind of a predictable, i.e. rule of law-based society. That's the good old-fashioned model that Mr. Hamburger loves, the constitutional model of tripartite uh, separation of powers and so forth. Now, how does the administrative state, the administrative state kind of musses things up quite a bit. Uh, the administrative state was created uh, in the late 19th century uh, primarily to get around this separation of powers, and particularly these nasty courts. Uh, now, maybe they were doing the bidding of big industry, or maybe they were just, you know, old-fashioned common law judges, I don't know, but uh, the progressives uh, thought they could do better if they set up a system of adjudication uh, that was administrative, uh, where the adjudicators were appointed by uh, the incumbent politicians and were deciding cases rather than courts. Um, and what did you get? You got extremely unpredictable uh, decision making. Not totally unpredictable, but much worse than courts because each administration, you know, look at the NLRB or look at the ICC or look at the FTC. The early versions of all those agencies were kind of a mess in terms of flip-flopping from one administration to the next in terms of their understanding of the law. Uh, the FTC, I think, was reversed by the Supreme Court in every single case that came before it for the first 20-some years of its existence. Um, uh, so uh, administrative adjudication uh, becomes uh, less predictable. Administrative fact-finding is, uh, is very bad. I agree with Philip on this point that, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, administrative agencies uh, can, are, the courts decided to defer to agencies on questions of fact because the courts couldn't keep up with everything. So, uh, you know, the agency's determinations of fact became uh, squirrely uh, uh, and, and sort of result-driven uh, depending upon uh, what the administration wants to do and so forth. So the early administrative state was not so good. Uh, eventually, we got the modern administrative state, which is feasts off rulemaking. Uh, uh, almost every agency has either rulemaking authority or was con contrived to have rulemaking authority. Uh, uh, but uh, then we, uh, the courts, uh, even, uh, and I agree also, the courts are sort of overwhelmed by all this. Uh, the courts start uh, extending these deference doctrines from questions of fact to questions of law. And you get the Chevron doctrine. I recently wrote a book about this, so don't get me started. But the, um, uh, the Chevron doctrine, I think, basically abets unpredictability and legal instability because each uh, administrative agency uh, for each administration is entitled to come up with a reasonable interpretation of ambiguities in the statute that fits the political preferences or the or policy prerogatives, if you want to call it that, of the administration. So 
in all sorts of areas of the law. Uh, net neutrality, if uh, Republicans don't, uh, don't like it, Democrats like it. Um, uh, aggressive action on climate change, Democrats like it, Republicans don't like it. Um, uh, regulation, aggressive relation, regulation of wetlands, Democrats like it, Republicans don't like it. The list goes on. So you've got this law starts flip-flopping with each administration and the courts feel obliged to defer to each interpretation. And so the law becomes increasingly unpredictable and unstable. And so uh, the growth of the administrative state, which I agree, I agree is with Professor Rosenblum, is inevitable, but I, I think it's, it's, it's become harder to um, say that it's generating predictable law. The final point is the one that uh, the late Judge Williams made, uh, who was an expert in this because he sat on the DC Circuit and reviewed these cases every day. Uh, he said the rule of law is in peril because there's too damn much law. Uh, <laughs> these agencies are cranking this stuff out at a frantic pace uh, and nobody uh, really can comprehend uh, all of the laws that uh, govern their behavior. Uh, uh, you, uh, maybe, maybe the big corporations can hire, hire fancy law firms, but I can guarantee you that even the best lawyers in those law firms don't understand everything that applies to their clients. Uh, and so the more law you get piling up like this, the less predictability you get or the more surprises you get uh, when you find out that something, uh, some restriction applies that you've never heard of before. And so I don't know what the answer to this is. I think it's a very serious problem. But uh, I think there are some small fixes we can make to try to improve the administrative state, make it more predictable. But they're kind of fine-tuned little things, uh, uh, not, 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 not pure fixes for this, about which I'm at this moment somewhat pessimistic. Well, before opening it up to questions generally, I guess I thought I might flip it back to the first two panelists. Um, I mean, I, I take Professor Merrill and I think Professor Cass's piece to be sort of defending this thin conception or predictability conception of the rule of law uh, and talking about what kinds of institutional designs would facilitate that. And I guess the question I would ask the first two panelists is, gosh, what's so wrong with that? Uh, and I guess I wonder, I mean, it seems like Professor Hamburger's view might be about predictability not being that great of value or about right. the futility of. Yeah, I, I think it's a second order virtue, mm -hmm. right? Does it have a legal system? It's a second order virtue. One can have all sorts of regimes that are quite awful and yet predictable. Uh, unpredictability is not the only evil out mm -hmm. there. Um, now, I can appreciate the aesthetic and convenience uh, I reasons. I, I know you didn't. Um, so, um, so I appreciate the aesthetic and convenience reasons for adopting it. Um, so I, I'd say it's a useful, um, I, a, a useful thing to have. I don't know if I'd put the rule of law label on it, but predictability, I agree, is, is, de is desirable generally, at least within our system. Um, I don't think everyone wants predictability. I think a lot of people thrive off unpredictability. So we might have to work at getting people to appreciate this. Um, the, the disappointment I have is that uh, whether you define rule of law as predictability or authorized by law, which is a common understanding of it, um, that doesn't really do the work we need. Um, now, the Constitution, as originally understood, does do that work, uh, but we've whittled that away. And uh, I suppose if you want a second order justification, you fall back on jurisprudence. So jurisprudence comes in to the aid of administrative power when the Constitution won't do. Uh, but I think there's some virtue in fighting for our rights. And I, I just I want to add something here. It's a little, a little bit off from what uh, Tom was discussing. We should not just think about originalism and what the Constitution requires. I think the living constitutionalists have a good point. We should talk about what's good for our society. And I happen to think the Constitution lists a lot of things that are good for our society, like having accountable lawmaking in an elected legislature. Our current system was designed to dilute the voting rights of, as Wilson put it, um, Irishmen, German and, uh, Germans, and Negroes or more generally, the great unwashed, the unfranchised, but the deplorable. It's designed to take voting power away from them and put it into the hands of the elites. This is not a healthy thing. It's not just unjust. It's also not going to lead to good places, right? At least alienation, anger, and so forth. Um, I'll just add that uh, because of the expansion of legislative power and the increasingly administrative nature of power, um, vast power now, flip, as, as Tom pointed out, flips back and forth presidential elections. This turns presidential elections into a form of warfare. 
I don't think we're going to survive that. So the administrative state is actually quite dangerous and that we haven't even got to jury rights, right? Um, or the right to, to have an unbiased adjudicator. So there's exceedingly dangerous stuff even if we weren't working from the Constitution. At which point I think the rule of law is just too thin a, a doctrine even though it may be useful to frame it for some purposes in terms of predictability. Sure. I'll just say two things. I'm delighted to be on the same side of Phillips. Since it seems like in some ways you might disagree, but I think I think there's a lot that I do agree with. Um, I just think that that some of the anxieties you're worried about are not the cause of the administrative state. They may just have more to do with modernity. And I, I will just on the uh, the predictability point. I, I couldn't agree more. And I wonder if the turn towards judges actually is a little is 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 a little um, misleading. I don't know if judges are actually more predictable, and I see that in two different directions, and I guess this is just in, in sort of dialogue with Tom, but on the one hand, as we're living through right now, right, you can have unbelievable shifts in deeply established doctrines coming right out of federal courts. So on the one hand, right, predictability is not, is not the province exclusively of the judiciary, and flip side, judges can be so committed to continuity that even in the midst of massive licensed legal change, they refuse to recognize it. So looking at the way in which in the decades after the Civil War, the Supreme Court and federal courts really participated together to try to minimize the way in which this was a fundamental remaking of the balance of power, the distribution of constitutional rights, the aim of legislation, and how effective they were at papering it over. Right? You even have opinions where they say quite explicitly, surely in enacting the 14th Amendment, people did not mean to fundamentally restructure the government, when of course that's exactly what the war was fought for. So I think my, my, my sort of, I, I take on board all of Tom's observations and points. I might just question whether turning to courts as opposed to administrative adjudicators makes things any better. Can I just come in and then I'll stop. I, on the question of modernity, um, are those who are worried about the administrative state anxious about modernity? Are we afraid about contemporary, of contemporary life? Do we want to return to the past? And I think this is, um, forgive me, nonsense. Um, the administrative, federal administrative state is introduced at the time of the horse and buggy, right? The current version, 1930s, none of us were alive then. Um, and so let's remember that this is a system of homogenized class power imposed from above. And that seems to me modernity might have more to do with a diverse people exercising power from below. I'm sorry, can I just, are you suggesting that the Constitution is not a form of homogenized class power imposed from above? Uh, well, not, it doesn't nearly compete with administrative power. Wait, I'm sorry, hold on. I just want to make sure you're really saying that the 1930s is less, excuse me, more homogenized class power imposed from above as compared to the, the United States federal constitution of 1789? I'm, I'm thinking about the administrative state of today where power, policymaking power, is exercised by the knowledge class, that's us, some of us have false consciousness, I agree, but it's, it's, it's class power imposed from above. My Dominican neighbors have no idea about the administration. But I'm not, state, sorry, Philip, I, 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 no, I don't want to argue with you about today. I'm just, I, I just want the comparative piece. I just want to make sure I'm understanding you right. It's your, it's, I'm you, talking you about really, today. Right, right, and you're saying that that is more class nomination, more um, than the Constitution. That's what I'm trying to feel. Like. Um, then, then equal voting rights, where our voting rights are not diminished. But we're talking, we're talking, we're not power. talking, we're not talking, we're not talking about equal voting rights. We're talking about the Constitution of 1789. What do you mean by we? I, I thought that's talk, what we were talking about. No, now. I was. Did I I was no, no, I'm, I'm talking about the administrative state today. I got you. So sorry. So what's the counter to the administrative state that's better? Uh, where we vote for our lawmakers. But which Constitution is that again? Well, it is the one created by the Fourteenth Amendment and Fifth Amendment. Gotcha. So you're so and you want to right compare? Okay. So so the sorry. Just to, I just really want to be clear. I'm comparing the administrative so we're adding, state with what we should have um, under the Constitution as amended, but including the Civil Rights Act. Of course. Excellent. So so well, some statutory. Is statutory, but it excellent. includes real enforcement. So so it's amendments. it's a it's a fundamental Constitution as, as you're envisioning it, cobbling together certain pieces. <laughs> which, I totally, which I'm totally on board with. I like this for, vision for, too. For, for, forgive me, but I think the Constitution we have as amended is one thing. Right, but it includes some statutes like the Civil Rights Act no, and that, some practices. That, that, that simply gives life to the Fifth Amendment, which wasn't done through discrimination, which was unlawful. Excellent. Okay. Under the Constitution. All right. Well, right. I can it's, see that. I can see there are others who will. Okay. Who are okay. Game to jump in. So, uh, Professor Epstein, you want to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we always need to give Professor Epstein a microphone. <laughs> no, no. I mean, panel. I'm gonna. All three of these people are my friends, so I'm staring them down. Um, one of the things that uh, is we talk about the thick and the thin conceptions. And but here, nobody was prepared to talk about the substantive views uh, that do it. To my view, if you have a classical liberal constitution, 
its essential objective is to create Pareto improvements without redistribution. The moment you relax that constraint and you allow redistribution to come in at the ground floor, there is no way that you can consistently hold to the rule of law uh, because there's no way to decide which of these is correct and which of them will go to what extent. And so what happens is the question you have to ask, and this is mostly to know, can you possibly figure out how to make this thing work if what you do is you give vast discretion in the political branches to essentially transfer wealth from rich to poor, from labor to non-labor, from one group to another. I don't think that you can. And so the question is, can, are we prepared to go back to a theory which has been refuted so many times that it's the ones that I believe that they have to be correct? Because if they were incorrect, they'd be refuted once and people would drop in. And so the question that you have to ask for yourself is can you think of a way to work the rule of law without having a classical liberal view. And I don't say libertarian because taxation, forced exchanges, eminent domain powers are very much a part. I can't see how you do it. And so I'm asking the three of you in the 15 seconds that I allot to each of you to give an authoritative <laughs> and definitive answer. Well, um, First of all, to clarify, I, I don't think predictability is the sort of greatest good uh, of all. I, didn't say that. I, I think it's just an, it's an interesting virtue that almost every individual who is not a criminal uh, uh, appreciates. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that in that sense, it's kind of a thin second order, whatever you want to call it. But um, I think that um, I think yes, I, I, I don't think we currently have a, a classical liberal uh, system in the United States. Amen. Bro. Uh, but, you know, a number of people flourish in the United States, uh, notwithstanding, not, notwithstanding the defective uh, policies that come out of uh, our governments. Uh, uh, and one reason why that's the case is because notwithstanding the excessive amount of law and the excessive amount of uncertainty about the law and so forth, that by and large, uh, people have been left enough space uh, after the you know laws are, have been predictably evaded uh, to uh, flourish, to start businesses, to start families, to start you know uh, trying to pursue their own aspirations. This is basically a kind of Hayekian vision of liberty that you know as long as uh, as long as uh, the laws that are on the books that coerce you are sufficiently predictable, people with modest ingenuity can learn how to navigate around those and can, can create a, a vibrant and, and productive lives for themselves. Uh, whether or not it's socialism or whether, I mean, he didn't like socialism, obviously, but, you know, whether or not it's a kind of a social welfare state or whether it's a classic liberal state or whether, I, could, I, I like the classic liberal ideal, Richard, I obviously know, I'm, I'm totally on board with it, that is a normative ideal. A little but, wobbly, I would say. <laughs> well, we disagree about Kilo, we always will, but. <laughs> yeah. but. But other than that, I mean, I, I, I think there's, you know, I'm, I'm just interested in what this means and, 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 and why I think it's a, 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 it's a thin, thin virtue, but I think it's a real one, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Thanks. So, Richard, I guess I, I, I approach these things less theoretically, perhaps because of my background in history. Um, I'd say there's no one threat and no one remedy. Um, so, for example, as you, you know, the, the danger isn't just redistribution. As you know, I, I got into this because of institutional review boards, right? And there, no one's taking, and no one's trying to take someone else's property. They're trying to help people. But the, the, the goal, the, the motivation behind this was to help people. Um, yes, but it, was, it, it wasn't redistribution in, in, in the simple sense, right? It, it was an attempt to help other people who seemed weak. Um, the net effect has been to kill hundreds of thousands, probably millions, particularly minorities, uh, died a higher death rate because of IRBs, because they're suppressing science scientific and medical knowledge. Uh, but in any case, so that's how I got into this, and it seems to me there are multiple threats. People's vanity and how trying to help others is as much a threat, I think, as trying to take other people's stuff. And by the same token, I think there's no one remedy. Uh, limiting, at least, administrative power would be a good move, but we may have to reform ourselves as well as our government. So I think there's a long way to go. Wow. Just two quick thoughts, which is that, that my recollection is that the greatest critic of bureaucracy is Trotsky. And so I'm delighted to see both Professor Epstein and Comrade Hamburger join me 
in, in a critique of bureaucracy in the name of a more pure form of government. So no problem with redistribution. <laughs> Um, I'll say for me, I, I just I want to come back to Tom's observation of the different traditions because there's a great book that just came out by Lorraine Batston, this professor of the history of science at Chicago, about rules, and she tries to reconstruct the different ways in which rules have evolved and been used, and she makes a point that I find totally fascinating, which is that for most of the history of Western philosophy, rule referred neither to an algorithm nor to something like a binding procedure but a third definition, which is no longer so prominent, which is the idea of the rule as a model to be aspired to. So when an artist made a bust that was supposed to be an exemplar of the genre, it was held up as the rule. And people recognized that you couldn't actually match it. And slavish imitation of the rule was not, in fact, learning the rule. But part of what it meant to be a competent artist was to have internalized something about that and try to reproduce it in your own life. And so I wonder if actually part of our challenge when it comes to governance or law is that we've taken rule too much in the kind of thin, binding, algorithmic sense, and not enough in this other sense of model, which might get us closer to what it would mean to sort of live a flourishing life, recognizing that in fact, you know, sometimes there are circumstances in which you might have to depart from an algorithm in, in, light, of, uh, in light of circumstances. So. Uh, go ahead. They beg to differ as a matter of art history, but I'll turn it over to Rick Jones because. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've not read the book, but I agree with it. The definition of a rule in the system which I'm doing always goes back to classical Roman conceptions of pleading. And those pleadings always start with prima facie cases, which are ordinarily the case, and then start to give you some exceptions. And the way in which you get to the conclusion is you run it out to joinder of issues. And in mathematical terms, this is a series of successive approximations, and that's exactly what she's talking about. So she's perfectly consistent with what I've said, but what you said is ghastly inconsistent with that particular model, uh, because the New Deal type of situation essentially has no constraints on the principles of redistribution, whereas if you use the model that I'm talking about, essentially everything that you're trying to do with each successive stage is to get rid of advantage taking. So we don't like aggression, but we do like self-defense, but we do like self-defense, but we don't like excessive force, but we do exclude excessive force when people are acting in good faith under pressure. And so I'm just going to say that I think that's the model that one wants to go to. And if you do go to it, this is an anti-redistributivist device. And I think I've said too much, so I'll sit down. <laughs> Other folks? Is it on? Yeah. I think okay. So the art commentary totally went above my head. I didn't understand it. I'm sorry. Um, looking at, at history, uh, this came out a little bit between Professor Hamburger and Professor Rosenblum. Uh, you, you meant, Professor Rosenblum, you mentioned the, the, the German and French traditions, and Professor Hamburger mentioned Roman law and, and the imperial Roman origins. Um, we don't get a lot of history in law school, I think, generally, but can't you see the, the American system as descendant from the English system, which both resisted Roman law, resisted the Catholic laws, canon law, even when England was still Catholic before the Reformation, um, and, and kind of had a very different system, even trying to get rid of the prerogatives and turning it into equity. So there's kind of a rule, even though it's still very discretionary and dealing with things like you know, damming up a river or environmental damages or diffuse torts in equity early on. Um, and, and how does that fit in with your analysis? Uh, just one more point about um, rules as inputs and outputs. I think that Blackstone also said that, uh, that, that, that the law, human laws should aspire to be like the laws of nature which he mentioned to be like motion, physics, and, and things like that. So just these two points, thanks. So I love this, and here, here I, think, I, I think Philip, I would want to work with Philip to try to reconstruct this history. I think we might want to distinguish between the history of administrative law and the history of the institutions of administration. And I would think, and, and here I invite commentary from those who are more well-versed in it, that when it comes to the history of administrative law, the story unfolds in several beats. And it, is, it does seem to me to be absolutely the case that the first actions of what we think of now as predecessors to modern administrative law are extensions of an English tradition of sort of the different uses of courts. And so the, the most prominent there is probably the law of officers and then the various kinds of writs, especially but not exclusively mandamus, that you might bring against government officers. Of course, modern administrative law you know, is some combination of evolutions of those doctrines. 
Um, they experience a massive transformation in the 1920s in particular as they confront institutions like the ICC, right? new kinds of administrative institutions, but then there's also statutory overlay. So where do those statutes come from? That's a, that's a, a really long and fascinating conversation. I think different statutes have slightly different provenance. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I believe that there's somebody on this panel who's written an incredible article about the origins of the appellate model of, of agency review, and, and that's a, a, its own really just fascinating history. But I think that we can tell that story in, in parallel to, although it's not the same as, the story of the construction of the institutions. And I don't think it's quite right to lay it all at the foot either of the Germans or the progressives. Right? We've got different institutions and commissions that have emerged at different moments. Some of them, I'm not sure what sort of precedents we can find for them. There's this, these tax assessors that Nick Perillo has written about in the early 1790s. Right? Those, those are sort of, they're, they're around. They obviously have origins, but they're, they're engaging with a very particular American problem, which has to do with the relationship between the states, the federal government, and the way our Constitution deals with taxation. Certainly by the time we get to the progressive era, so Daniel Rogers, a historian at Princeton, has written about this. There's a, a massive North Atlantic dialogue involving England, Scotland, Belgium, Austria, France, the United States, mostly focused at the city level, trying to figure out how should we organize our institutions to deal with some of the new problems of industrialization. And of course, Richard will be upset. Redistribution is a major part of that. But it's not just redistribution. It's also things like building sewer systems and tram lines. And so that gets us into a, a whole different tradition of administrative institutions, um, which, which also go federal. So, so a, long, a long answer to your question, I think mostly to say, yes, I think it's a great question. And I might even want to distinguish the affiliations a little bit more, and I think it would get us into not only England, but also areas that seem pretty far afield from a traditional legal curriculum, like what is the best way to build housing in you know, 1910, given access to certain materials and sourcing. That ends up being really important for the design of American administrative institutions. Can I take this opportunity, actually, to agree? Um, I, I think this all comes in layers, and it is important to separate them out. And there's a it's a very important local versus federal distinction in all of this. Uh, copying the English, some early American states begin adopting, even at a state level, some of the what we call administrative mechanisms that had flourished earlier at a very, very local level. Um, and uh, Edith Henderson wrote a little book about this in the early 20th century. And it's about local, you know, the, whether or not various writs for review of local institutions can be seen as the origins of administrative power. Of course, it involves uh, very powerful uh, doctrines on officer liability. Um, and, uh, but I don't think this is, at the federal level, something else is going on. And it's much more dangerous when, when you pull these, these local institutions up to the federal level. Um, First of all, uh, Nick Perillo's very learned ta article on the 1798 tax and the successors, I think we quite misunderstand what's going on there. Um, the statute is quite explicit in using language which, according to precedent, makes clear these tax assessments um, are determinations which are expected to be judicial in nature, not legislative. I don't want to dig into that now. I think I think it completely misreads the statute. Um, federal administrative power um, although there are echoes of the local version, is drawn from the imperial tradition primarily through Prussia. Um, one can't believe how many Americans went to study this stuff from the Prussians. Woodrow Wilson actually is quite distinctive because he did not know German, right? And he didn't go to Germany, unlike the rest. So he actually doesn't have it from the source. And one of the problems then is he's working from these German materials in America, which he mistranslates. It's quite funny. He mis when he's original, it's because he mistranslates the German texts. Um, and, and so I think we have to understand this is a centralized version of this power. And that's always much, much more dangerous. And just to give you a hint of that, it's no accident that officer liability is cut off, right? Because you're facing up against the government. And at that point, um, you have a very different system. So I, I completely agree about that, or not about Woodrow Wilson, although I agree about him not speaking German and the importance of the studies. <laughs> Let me make a small point. Um, I, I actually agree that there's this uh, very fundamental distinction between administrative law, understood to be the APA and what the courts say about agencies and so forth, and, and then the question of public administration or whatever you want to call it. So, I recently had uh, separate conversations with two people that I think are reasonably well formed, informed about what goes on in the deep state. One was Cass Sunstein and the other was um, 
Tim Wu just came back from two years trying to orchestrate things from the from the from the Biden um, White House, and they both independently offered the same observation, which I found quite stunning, which is that they have had much more success. The Democrats, I mean, in um, corralling and coordinating independent regulatory commissions than cabinet departments. Now, why might that, this is contrary to all the theory, right? You know, the president can dismiss the secretary of uh, the cabinet at will, and so obviously they're going to click their heels and salute when the president uh, or the White House calls. Um, and the commissioners are all, you know, have job security. They're, you know, protected against dismissal except for cause and so forth. So that's apparently all wrong. Um, now, what might the explanation be? The might, explanation might be that these commissions are primarily engaged in regulatory activities. Um, uh, they have smaller staffs, um, uh, whereas these executive departments are behemoths that are spending billions of dollars, and they have clusters of interest groups circling around them all the time uh, and providing revolving door opportunities for the senior staff and so forth. So I think, you know, the, we teach that administrative law have kind of missed the boat to some extent by assuming that these uh, uh, these uh, re these devices that sort of suggest control from the president to the uh, uh, underlying agencies are somehow definitively controlling. It may be a much more a matter of uh, structure and, and heft and mass and so forth than, than that. Yeah. Other folks. So. Okay, this is on. So I think early on, Professor Rosenblum and Professor Hamburger kind of touched on non-delegation um, at the founding. So I'm curious if you guys can, in a very brief period of time, square the circle of the, you know, shall legislate, shall execute, um, versus the early founding evidence from, like, Professor Perillo who, and, like, uh, Bagley and uh, Mortensen. Just... Like, why is there pre like certain pra patterns and practices that are delegative, uh, and then why is the text, you know, seemingly not so? Well, so I, I just I buy the Mortensen line, which is that the executive power is an empty vessel that is defined precisely by the execution of legislation. I think I mean if, if I could ask Philip a question, it would be how do we distinguish conceptually between these three different categories? Um, and that seems to me to be the basic puzzle. So I think that the constitutional text uh, ends up assigning, and I think Julian says this in his article on the executive power in the Penn Law Review, right, it's trying to construct a complete government, which to me makes a lot of sense in response to the failures of the Articles of Confederation. So if that's your aim, then the real issue is can you carry an authoritative directive through to execution, but the very same power could be understood as legislative or executive depending on what vantage point you're looking at it from which explains why from the very beginning of the Republic, you've got things like Congress asking the president to cite post roads, even though everybody acknowledges that that's one of Congress's powers. And depending on how you were to spin that one, you could see it as executive or legislative, or I guess even maybe adjudicative. You could imagine somebody fighting about where the post road should go and wanting to bring it in front of the judge. But here I'm really just parroting other people's views. So you can just, the, the Rosenblum position is that I've yet to see a decisive refutation of the Mortensen position, Julian's position, but if, if Philip has one, I'll be delighted to read it and explain why it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the simple answer is read my non-delegation blues, which will be coming out in the George Washington Law Review. Uh, but it's not so simple. It's like 100 pages long. <laughs> well, that's right. It's not thin. Um, <laughs> but most scholarship shouldn't be thin. Uh, now, just a few little points just to touch on them. Um, just methodologically, um, I would describe the Mortensen-Bagley approach to scholarship as originalism without the net. You know, Auden described blank verse as tennis without the net. Re you don't really require much effort without a net. Um, originalism, this is originalism without the framing and without the text, because the moment you include those, it gets all very awkward. Um, so to look at what people in diff very different circumstances say in the course of the 18th century leaves a bit of a muddle. But if you actually look what happened in Philadelphia and the product of that, it becomes much clearer. Now, on executive power, um, Mortens and Bagley have two quotations to support in, in, in their Don Delegation piece. 
that were meant to be the prime quotations, the best ones they have, to support the view that executive power is an empty vessel that just gets filled by the legislature. And those quotations come from Rousseau and Rutherford, a very learned lecturer in Cambridge. Um, those quotations, by their own terms, refute their position. They refer to the executive power as the joint strength of the society. But, right? Sorry, I, I thought, wait, hold on. If we're talking about executive power, right. Julian has those two other articles. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm just pointing out. But that's the, not the non-delegation article. Those right, are the 200 right. other pages, know, which involve literally thousands of citations. Right. So, let, so let if me, the argument so is going to be that, the, that, the, yeah. that it's an empty vessel, right. I think you have to right. engage with that other evidence. Yes, and so let me do that right now then. Okay. Um, which is, there are many 18th century folks who summarize executive power is, is domestic law enforcement. But they often elsewhere will say, look, executive power, although academically, and this is a distinction Rutherford gets because he's an academic, academically, there's a lot of push from the content to define it as domestic law enforcement because that seems to constrain. But they acknowledge the executive exercises enormous power abroad. And so foreign power cannot be so bound by law. And so they adopt the, very, the medieval understanding of executive power as the action force or strength of society. And that incorporates both. And by the way, we know that's what the Constitution adopts for two reasons. One is the distinction between the vesting of executive power and the take care clause about executing the power. I won't go into that now. You can read it in Non-Delegation Blues. It's a complicated argument. But textually, we know that it's much more, that this is, this is a broader executive power. And second, Hamilton in the Federalist talks about uh, the uh, w will, judgment, and force. He's echoing the old ideas that inform the separation of powers. You may disagree with it, but there's a, there is substantial evidence with textual support for this understanding of executive power. Now, leave that aside for a minute. Um, let's deal with delegation. Um, the framing has a debate. Aaron, uh, Aaron Gordon wrote a very nice piece on this, and I've written on two. A debate over executive over whether the executive can exercise congressionally delegated power, and they reject that. I think that's informative. And the text, for reasons I suggested, is very informative. I don't think you can do originalism without that. And then as to what's included in legislative power, and then I'll stop, um, they understood legislative power naturally to be rules that bind, right? But that wasn't the full extent of, to the extent they're authorized by the Constitution. But that's not the full extent of legislative power. You can artificially add, as the Constitution does, all sorts of other things, like just spending, distributing benefits, and the like. Um, but we don't have to worry about theoretical definitions, because the Constitution tells us what legislative power is. And there's only one place where it tells us about regulation in the, in the list of these powers, the regulation of interstate commerce, which is the font of most administrative power. That's a legislative power, and it shall be vested in Congress, and Congress does not have, as in Article Three, the authority to des designate another location. So I think the text alone is the problem. I really don't care what Mordenson and Bagley have to say, or for that matter, what <laughs> Delegation Blues has to say. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm with Scalia on this issue. Uh, you know, he, he was uh, a very keen observer of the administrative state and the administrative law, and he concluded, and he, he read all the cases, and he concluded that the idea of limiting uh, what Congress can do based on its giving away too much discretion to executive agencies is impossible because it's a matter of degree and there's no clear way of distinguishing between too much and, and, and too, too little. Um, and that was consistently his position. It's not the hill to die on, folks, uh, this idea of too much discretion. Uh, it's just not going to work. The hill to die on is the idea that Congress has to authorize uh, activities by the executive, by agencies, and for that matter, by courts. That's an, that's an enforceable proposition. It's consistent with the text of the Constitution, and it's one that I think uh, right-thinking people uh, should struggle and fight to preserve. I don't think this idea of reviving the non-delegation doctrine uh, you know, based on giving too much discretion here, or not, you know, it, it's not, it's not going to happen. It's, it's not going to be administrable. Uh, Gorsuch is a very clever guy, but his idea about filling in the details is going to end up being the same thing as, as uh, intelligible principle in the final analysis. Can I, can I disagree with Tom? I agree that discretion is not the hill to die on, but that's not my argument. So go figure. That may be uh, our last word if we're... If this panel ends at 425, does it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Although we have, we have three meetings to go through in five minutes. If, you want. If, there's, if there's one more question. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> Professor Epstein is, is sort of raising his hand. <laughs> I, I think it's a hill worth dying on. I don't know whether you could make it go, but let me do a, a couple of points. One is take the revolutionary pension stuff, right? Uh, you could not simply say to an agency, figure out how much money you want to spend and decide uh, how to spend it on whom. Uh, it seems to me that any time you're talking about an appropriation issue, it has to come from Congress. And at that point, the fill in the detail stuff looks a little bit better uh, because what it's saying is we have no idea who's going to be eligible. Here's the pot of money. Here's a general set of standards. And you, I hate to use the phrase, fill in the details. So the patent stuff is the same thing. Um, if you try to do this by way of a statute, you could find no terms more precise than the ones that are used in the delegation. It seems very hard to me when you're talking about that and the way the subject matter goes to say that this is an illustration of runaway stuff when it's the other way. Take a case like Gundy. Um, that's an easy case. Um, every single academic on every side who wrote about it said that this was impermissible delegation. Do you agree? Yeah. All right, so there is some teeth to it. Well, yeah, and the question is like, why? And it's because if you give a decision as to whether or not to make something retroactive, and if Congress cannot decide that question, it cannot punt it down to the other party. Uh, so it's maybe a hill lit, uh, but it is something to fight over. And the moment you can see that case as being one where it applies, it seems to me you can't go the whole way with Scalia. And would I really want to go the whole way with somebody who wrote our? Well, but because he appudiated the position that he had taken. I, Allo is a situation in which it turns out that you can say a supervisor at the commander level is just an ordinary employee. It's just intellectual double talk. Um, and so I think you guys have given up too much. Mortensen and Bagley, and basically what happens is they don't know enough about the substantive law of any of the areas that they write about uh, to make anything that's authoritative. And the single biggest vice of public lawyers, I'm, looking around, and you can figure out whether you are or not that side, is public lawyers who don't know private law are public menaces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone want to respond to that, or you want that yeah, to be the last I, part? I will. So Richard. <laughs> Richard, I, I love that aphorism. Um, I, I just want to note that the examples you gave uh, involving pensions and patents, those are what used to be considered privileges, and we can dispute whether they should be considered that, but they used to be considered privileges and not constraints. So there's a lot of freedom there to leave discretion, and it's I, people like me with no objection to that discretion. Um, it could be vast. I think there are and, more limitations on coercion. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So um, constraints on this, then there's got to be more. Right. And, and, but I want to pick up on something you hinted at um, I think our worrying about the administrative state is too, is too little too late. Um, the reality is the current threat is much worse than that. It's what you hinted at, which is the privatization of legislative and judicial power. Uh, a vast amount of our controls are now delegated to private employers, universities, web, uh, web companies. And that is the way we're going to be governed. And it's a much more serious problem than I think we're addressing in but administrative you can power. I would love to control it. If you want. All right, well, maybe that's the next NYU forum. I don't know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can give a round of applause to all of our panelists. <laughs>